Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to CIBC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. I'm delighted this evening to um, welcome another sponsor uh, for this lecture, uh, the law firm Davies Ward Phillips and, Vi and, and uh, Weinberg. Um, and I welcome Graham Ross, who's here. Graham, I'm not sure if there's two of the lights that you bright. There's, there's Graham there. Um, Davies Ward Phillips and Weinberg, which most of the time I see simply see is referred to as Davies, um, uh, is an integrated firm. Um, it's a big one, over 250 lawyers with offices Toronto, Montreal, uh, New York, and uh, an affiliate in Paris. Um, it is one of the better known, uh, or perhaps the best uh, known law firm in Canada, specializing on business law. Um, and as they say, they are consistently at the heart of the largest and most complex commercial and financial matters on behalf of their clients. Um, doesn't mean that they can't work with you, so uh, keep that in mind. Anyway, delighted to have their sponsorship for the course here. Uh, welcome them here. Um, uh, for today's lecture, um, and again, I'm in, in, uh, delighted to invite back uh, Professor A.J. Agrawal from the, the Rotman School. Uh, I think this is A.J.'s third lecture. Um, I always personally look forward to his lectures. They're, they're a lot of fun. Um, and and you know, just to give you a little, and I think we circulated A.J.'s bio, but may not have done justice because um, AJ is the Peter Monk Professor of Entrepreneurship uh, at the Rotman School, but if you if you had gone to his website, you would have seen he does a lot of work uh, with companies. Um, he's very hands-on with small companies on company boards, but has also uh, worked with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, uh, Canadian Recording Industry Association, TVO, um, Genzyme Canada. So AJ is a prof who's really out there working with uh, the community and with industry, which I think uh, colors the way he presents things here. Um, AJ is going to be talking to us today, and what was it, the three... Uh, three key questions. There you go. AJ, over to you. <clears throat> okay. Thanks very much, uh, Tony, uh, for inviting me. Couldn't have been so bad last time if I got invited back again. <clears throat> um, and uh, thanks uh, to those uh, interested to come in and hear what I have to say. I'm going to talk today about what I think are the, th the three key questions for, <coughs> pardon me, for technology entrepreneurs. And just to help me calibrate <clears throat> in terms of the audience, how many people here are uh, students or uh, graduate students? Okay, quite a few. <clears throat> and uh, how many people are in the life sciences? Okay, software? And let's say... Uh, double E or Mac Eng that's not software uh, focused. Okay. Uh, optics. Anybody's focusing on optics here? Okay, couple. Uh, all right. So I will try to. Uh, some of the things I have to say I will point out I think are more relevant for certain sectors uh, than others. The th here are the three questions. Uh, they are purposefully broad, and I think they are sort of a useful way to think about organizing the challenges that one has in terms of taking a very early stage technology uh, into, uh, into a business. They are, um, they are deceptively simple. So the first is, what's my, what's my business? There was a great study done by a, a fellow named Scott Shane, who was a professor at MIT, uh, in the business school, who took a technology, it was a, it was a three dimensional printing technology, and he took it to his MBA course at the Sloan School. And the exercise that he gave the students in the MBA class was uh, take this away, this, here are the specs for this innovation. It came from uh, the uh, McEnge Lab at, uh, uh, department at MIT. And Come back in two months with a business plan that, in your view, would make the most amount of money from this invention. 
And so this, the, the class was broken into teams. That was their term assignment. And off they went. And about two and a half months later, they came back. They submitted their business plans. This was going to be the primary component of their grade other than the final exam. And here was the interesting finding. Same technology, so three-dimensional printing, so the, the, the one-sentence uh, description is you can think of it like a photocopier that knocks out an, an image in two dimensions. Uh, this instead uh, uh, spits out a, uh, the image or the in, in three dimensions in, in something that looks like a clay. And so the business plans came back, and they range from applications in architecture, uh, so uh, architecture firms that would use this for uh, printing out three-dimensional models of uh, what they were working on, to uh, medical applications, to dental applications in, for, in the form of, of uh, teeth moldings, and pharmaceutical applications in terms of the microstructure of, uh, of pills. And he documented each of the business plans, what their focus was, what the essence of the, of the product area was, uh, the market size, and so on, and the members of the team who were, who's, who were charged with writing a business plan for this technology. And one of the observations was that even though they were all MIT MBAs and they all knew what discounted cash flows were and how to, you know, what it meant to maximize the value of the business, why didn't they all end up with the same business plan, with the same application. They all had access to the internet for two and a half months. They could do market research and so on. Yet each one, um, you know, there were, there were some uh, uh, business plans that had a reasonable amount of overlap, but there was a lot of, a lot of variation. And his, his point was that, you know, it wasn't a surprise that the team that uh, wrote a business plan and chose to focus on the dental market application had a dentist on their team. And the team that, that did the architectural application had both a civil structural engineer and an architect on that team, amongst some others. And the point was, in they, they had the, the deepest understanding. They understood where the problems were and where this technical so solution um, would find value in that industry and, and in, in what part of the industry and, and how it could be priced and so on. So, you know, I use this to, th to illustrate this notion of thinking about what's one's business. Um, some people don't, they can bypass this, this question in the sense that they are in an engineering lab working on a problem that has been brought to them by industry and they know precisely sort of, of the problem they're trying to solve and, and, and the market problem they're trying to address. Many others don't. Uh, people are working on something and, in, in the lab and they think it's, it's cool and somebody must have a use for this, or maybe there's m many uses, but they don't really have a, a, a very good nuanced view of uh, how the industry works and what are the economics uh, of the industry, of, of whichever industries uh, there's a potential application. And so thinking through what one's business is in that setting turns out to be a non-trivial problem. We'll talk about uh, a, f a few aspects of how, how to think about that issue. The second is what's my business model? So once one has an idea of the, of the uh, industry that they're going to pursue, there's all sorts of ways of doing that. Uh, I think from about 1998 to 2000, and certainly to, to so let's say 96 to 2000, but perhaps uh, there's still some hangover from that even today, basically during the, the rise of the dot-com period, uh, the primary mechanism that everybody thought about was, I have an idea, I write a business plan, I make sure on page seven there's a hockey stick graph that shows that my revenues will go up very sharply, and then I walk into a VC's office, and that's the route to commercializing an early stage technology. We've certainly seen before the rise of the dot-com uh, period, and then subsequent to the market correction after that, and I use the term correction as a euphemism, um, that there are many ways for taking a technology to market other than uh, starting a company and raising venture capital, uh, such as uh, uh, not selling a product at all, but, but rather licensing the idea, or keeping the product in-house, not manufacture anything, and instead selling a service. 
uh, so there, and, 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 um, and a variety of others, but those being the primary ones, uh, launching a company, um, selling a, that sells products, uh, selling a service that uh, simply sells the output of the product and licensing the technology. Finally, pricing. Uh, pricing, it turns out to be reasonably non-trivial, and I find that it's an area that in particular engineers uh, that, that haven't been in a business setting come to the pricing problem uh, with a very different view than how economists uh, think about pricing. So let me start with, with uh, a couple of quick examples. The first one, I, and for those who are, anyone who's here last year, I mentioned this example, but in a different context. Uh, let me tell you the, the quick story behind motion metrics. A, a graduate student comes from Sharif University to UBC in Vancouver, Sharif being the Waterloo of, MIT, of uh, Iran, and works, ends up working with a professor named Peter Lawrence, who's in the robotics department at UBC. And, uh, Professor Lawrence is reasonably connected to the, uh, to the mining industry. And so this uh, young graduate student ends up doing their doctoral thesis on developing an algorithm for uh, dynamic, what, they, what, what do you call dynamic payload monitoring. And the basic idea is that in mines, they use these big excavators that have multiple joints. And the idea is when an excavator picks up a load and is, let's say, moving it from point A to point B, they want to take, uh, they want to know the weight of the load. And uh, it's probably not surprising that knowing the weight without stopping the machine when there's multiple uh, joints and, and the, the arm is in motion uh, is, a, is, a, is a, uh, a non-trivial problem. So anyways, it's uh, non-trivial to the extent that it's worthy of a PhD uh, dissertation. So he spends dissertation working on the problem, and uh, the problem was posed by a, uh, a field engineer at Syncrude, and uh, comes up with a, a solution to the problem, and I'll define solution here as being one's a, sol a solution that met the specification, the performance specifications that uh, Syncrude had outlined would be of use to them, and uh, finishes his dissertation, decides this is a, uh, uh, a, an interesting problem, and uh, it must be worth something to the mining industry, so starts a company. The company's called Motion Metrics. Um, uh, founds it on the perimeter of the UBC campus, and then starts knocking on the doors of mining companies trying to sell this payload, uh, dynamic payload monitoring system. It turns out that uh, after additional several years of research and applying for IRAP grants and various uh, uh, provincial and federal grants, that this product is not the, the, the problem this product addresses is not of sufficient pain to the company that they want to, A, pay for it, and B, get into the business of putting all sorts of actuators and, and, and so on on their machines and, and put a CPU in the cab with a, with a, a, a variety of, of screens and so on that, will, uh, that the operator can see. And so the product never takes off. While this engineer is working on trying to get this prototype um, functional and, and is at the Syncrude test site, the engineer casually tells him about another problem, which is the broken tooth problem. And so on here you can see uh, there's an excavator in the top left corner. On the top right is a close-up of the teeth. So these excavators have teeth on them. And from time to time, these teeth, when they're take, taking a, a load, they're digging a load, a tooth breaks off. There's a broken tooth in the bottom left. Uh, as you can see, it's sort of hard to see. It, sometimes it falls into the rocks uh, along the, uh, uh, outside of the excavator. Sometimes the tooth falls inside the excavator bucket. This becomes a problem. The excavator, the guy sitting in the cab, as you can see, it's a very big machine. He has no idea the tooth's fallen off. He dumps the load into the truck. The truck takes that to a crusher. The crusher crushes the rocks but, but is damaged by the tooth if there's a steel tooth in that load. The crusher gets shut down. That's uh, very often a million bucks a day problem uh, or, or higher. So he ends up shifting directions and we'll start working on an imaging problem 
of trying to detect when a tooth falls off. And it turns out, once again, to be a somewhat non-trivial problem because these things are working in very dirty, uh, dark, uh, often underground settings. Uh, the tooth is camouflaged with the rocks and, and so on and so forth. So actually accurately identifying a, a tooth when it breaks, especially given that the rocks get lodged in between the teeth from time to time, becomes um, a technically non-trivial problem. But it turns out this is the, this, is, this is a problem that crushes the threshold. He solves a problem, comes back to Syncrude, and they say, you know, we like this, we'll buy it. Uh, and then he, he uh, carries on and, and goes, uh, starts knocking on some other doors. It turns out there's something unfortunate about mines, which is mines are not all located around the perimeter of Vancouver. So that means he's uh, putting these things in his briefcase and climbing on planes and flying from Vancouver to Botswana and all over the, the world, um, trying to sell a small device that is essentially a camera that's going to mount onto, onto an excavator with a, with a screen uh, uh, inside the cab and a CPU. So the question becomes, what's his business model? The bit, in other words, should he sell his software to somebody else who's already selling other systems. So they're selling nine other systems to, to, to mining companies, and this will just become number 10. They're already getting on a plane. They're already flying to Botswana. They're already flying to Indonesia and, and into South America. They've already got purchasing relationships with all the major mines. Now they just add one more page to the back of their catalog. So is the, is the, is the model here that the inventor sells the idea to somebody else and they uh, manufacture the product and sell it? Or does he manufacture the product and just sell it to a distributor? Or does he continue getting on planes with his own tooth, broken tooth detection system and try going right to the customer? There's a, a whole set of issues in terms of, of figuring out uh, what's the, the, the optimal answer. In this case, he decided there were benefits to going direct to the customer. Uh, first off, the product was very early stage, and he thought, you know, we, we need to be the guys who are climbing on top of these big machines and installing them because we want to see every problem they have. We want to see how they use it when they get in the cabs, what features of the software are they using and are they not using. We're going to lose that critical information for improving our product if somebody else is, is distributing, installing, and maintaining our systems. Um, but the point here is, and I'm going to get into sort of some more of just the, the general economics of thinking about, uh, we, in this case, he knew the business. Once he switched from the payload monitoring to the broken tooth, he decided, discovered, okay, that was his business, but there's still the issue of the business model. Uh, and then pricing turns into a, uh, a whole other story. Okay, one more uh, just illustrative example, and then we'll get into uh, a, a couple of general remarks. So here's an email. I'm going to ask nobody to shout out the answer. Uh, some people are going to get this very fast, and some are going, to, are going to struggle over this a little longer. So let me, the question here is, who wrote this email? Uh, oh, and that's right. For the camera people, if you can, this is the part where it needs to black out, because I don't have permission to show this email outside of the, outside of the room. Um, so this is an email written in 1997. And it's... Uh, the, here's, the, here's sort of the clues I'll offer. It's written by a, an engineering student. The student writes this email to a person um, called, uh, called Lewis, and they're making a few assumptions at the top of their email. They're saying that the average cost of a person in, in this email that they're about to write is 100K per year. Uh, they're going to talk about some software stuff, that, and they're going to make some estimations about uh, page views. Uh, they're going to talk about um, revenues. They're going to talk about costs. Uh, this person happens to be at Stanford, and they're going to say that uh, their time is worth $100,000 a year, so they're estimating it takes them 1.3 years, so it's 130K. Uh, that, and then they go on to estimate a few other things. A half a year or a half year of a programmer is going to be 50K. Faculty consulting, a faculty at Stanford are apparently quite cheap, uh, 50K and, and uh, some computer time and bandwidth. And so the cost of what they're doing, they say, is, is 500K. OK, they are talking to a company that some of you probably still remember. 
uh, which is Excite. And he says, um, I've given away the gender now, uh, that the, he t t talks about what he thinks are the benefits to Excite. He, line, he, he lists them out. And so he says he thinks the benefits to Excite um, are $7 million, or $7 million in the first year. Uh, and then he's going to go on and, and talk a little bit about uh, competitors uh, like Alta Vista. Um, now, basically, he's a student trying to sell his, algor his algorithm. Um, and he's hoping to sell it uh, and do a deal with uh, Excite through the technology licensing office. And now this is where he, this is where he, you know, this is the sort of student threat where he says, uh, this is, these are the losses to excite if they don't, uh, you know, if they don't li uh, license my technology. He says, here's what I think you'll lose in ad revenue and so on. And so he says, the expected losses to excite, 2.3 million. Okay. Uh, he shows some ex excite stock data. Uh, at that point, excite's worth 160 million bucks. Now here's his proposal. Okay, so this is where I think it's sort of most interesting. So you can put yourself in the shoes of this author. Uh, you have some invention and you're thinking about um, how you might commercialize it. This is his thought process. In 1997, he has what he thinks is a useful algorithm and he's offering a proposal for how he thinks this should be commercialized. All right. Here's what he wants to do. He wants to work full time exclusively for Excite for a minimum of seven months uh, until August. And he, wa he wants to make sure that everyone realizes that August is the cutoff date because he wants to go back to school. So he wants to get back in, uh, move back into the 97 academic year if he chooses. He wants to keep his option open, go back, uh, back to school. After he goes back to school, he wants to continue consulting one day a week. Um, uh, for, for up, up to another year, from August uh, 07 to 08, uh, uh, 97 to 98. And he points out that he can still do this while he's a student. Um, and then he wants to make sure that if he implements within three months, he gets a bonus. Okay, so for those of you who figured out who this is, you'll realize how humorous uh, the, this, these, this sort of modest proposal is. Uh, he wants to point out the compensation should be based on the success of the system. That seems very reasonable. And he wants to, he says, look, there's several ways in which you can pay me. You can pay me cash. You can pay me stock. But what he would really like is salary. Um, in other words, they can, buy, they can sort of pay for this algor algorithm outright in a lump sum. But he would rather he be paid as a function of his time. And then there's some dude called Vinod who apparently told him, well, why don't, you know, another option is you can roll this into a company and Excite can buy the, buy the company. Uh, okay. By now, you know, I suspect most people, um, Vinod will be another clue for anyone who sort of still hasn't, hasn't zoomed in on this, uh, on who this is. Uh, he points out here that I will only agree to this type of time, this kind of time commitment. So he's, this is where he's laying down the law as a, as a uh, student, graduate student at Stanford. He said, look, I will only agree to this kind of time commitment if there is significant compensation behind it. Now keep in mind, the compensation he's talking about is $100,000 a year salary, uh, including, and, and including some kind of bonus. Otherwise, I will want to reduce my time commitment and provide for an exit option to one day a week consulting once the system is implemented fully. Um, and of course, if everything goes well, I want to stay at Excite longer. Uh, okay, so skill testing question. This email was authored by anybody? Someone at Microsoft. Right, Larry Page of Google. So, uh, as you know, Google was founded uh, in 1998, a year after that email was written, uh, and they took a. They decided the commercialization path was not going to be licensing the technology uh, to Excite, but rather to launch a company. And while I don't need to put up the next slide, it's just fun to do this. Uh, this is our number one bank in Canada, uh, founded in uh, about 150 years ago. 
60,000 employees. Value of the company as of 3 o'clock this afternoon, who knows what it closed at. Um, but as of 3, 50 billion. Research in motion, uh, about 30 years old, 8,000 people, 30 billion, uh, and, and of course Google. Thinking through, you know, when you read, the, to me, when I read that email, I think about how delicate a process it is and how close that came to being rolled into Excite. And that, that, that Larry Page would have been an employee of Excite. Um, and it's not, you know, who knows what, what role he would have played there. And so when one winds back the tape, to that period in Google's history and thinks about the very critical decisions that were made in that 12-month period between the time that email was made and the time that Google, uh, the, the company was founded, uh, which was about six years before it went public. Um, it's, you know, a remarkable set of decisions were made. And those are the decisions that uh, that I'm talking about today, which are ones of, of thinking about what is, the, what is the route to taking this innovation into the market. So let me, let me uh, describe how economists think about the profitability of markets. So, so going back to the three-dimensional printer example, you know, one of the things that first-year MBAs that arrive at the Rotman School do is when they're given a project like the 3D exercise, the obvious instinct is to simply look for the industry that is the biggest, because the biggest industry means the most money. Obviously, that is, you know, after one thinks about it for, for more than just a few minutes, that's not necessarily where one can make the most money. It's not necessarily the best uh, uh, application for, for a, a, uh, a new venture. Market size is only one, is, you know, if market size goes to zero, there's clearly no business. But if market size is very large, but the industry is highly competitive, uh, then of course a large market size uh, is meaningless if profits are, 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 are uh, prices are forced down to, to cost, which is what happens in competitive uh, businesses, uh, industries. This issue of social relationships, one of the leaders, uh, research leaders in this field happens to be at the University of Toronto, a uh, professor named Olaf Sorensen, uh, who I suspect has been here or, or will be at some point. He he's, uh, lectures on venture capital. But he has spent a significant amount of time understanding the importance of social networks. And here's sort of the, let me, if I distill it down to a paragraph, you know, we, we often discount stuff like social relationships and social networks as being really fuzzy and, and, and therefore not that useful. Economists care a lot about transactions. That is buying and selling, whether it's buying and selling ideas, IP, uh, labor, in terms of you know, if, if you have a, a young startup firm and you're recruiting somebody, you are competing in the labor market. And if you recruit them, there's been a transaction in the labor market. And any time there's a transaction, economists view that as being value creating. In other words, for two people to make a trade or for a transaction to occur, for them to have the incentive to do that, there must be some kind of gain uh, that at least one person must be better off from the trade and the other has to be at least as, uh, as well off as they were before um, in order for that, that exchange to occur. Otherwise, in, in the case of a willing buyer, willing seller, the exchange won't happen. Now, in the case of entrepreneurship, all the things that one does when one's starting a company, you are recruiting people, you're recruiting resources, you're finding a place to, to, to uh, locate your, your company, you need some legal services, uh, you need some materials, uh, perhaps some computers, some lab equipment, whatever. All of those things require some kind of market exchange. In many cases, particularly for entrepreneurs, it's hard to contract 
uh, what are, what's called complete, you know, what economists think of as complete contracting. In other words, you know, for every one of those exchanges, there's, you can't write a complete contract. It's way too costly, especially relative to the resources of an entrepreneur. So there's so much that is predicated on trust. In other words, if you take an entrepreneur who's living in Toronto and you drop them in Silicon Valley, despite the fact that Silicon Valley has all sorts of, of sort of great entrepreneurial features, that person does not have access to their social network they lose a tremendous amount of their value because they don't have trust relationships to enable transactions that they can't contract for. So there's been a, a substantial amount of research in the management literature about how important social relationships are uh, in the formation of, uh, you know, in, in, in um, a firm foundation, entrepreneurship. And so when one is thinking about what business to be in, it's not unreasonable to be influenced by where one's social networks lie. In other words, if you have an, an innovation and you happen to know people in a particular industry that can be part, either employees or strategic partners or whatever, that will help you navigate through uh, taking that technology into that industry, even if that industry in other dimensions isn't, doesn't look like it's the best industry, those, you know, the uh, the social relationships turn out to, uh, to be uh, a, a factor that in some cases can outweigh uh, some of the others. Also, there's this cost of switching businesses, meaning that there is, a, there is some sense of irreversibility of decisions. That is to say, you have a technology and you say, well, we could take this to the mining industry or the oil industry or the, or the financial services industry, and once you start making investments in taking that uh, innovation to one of these in industrial sectors, it's not costless to change gears and switch. You invest in the relationships, in the customers, in, in the industry-specific knowledge. Uh, and so uh, switching, switching industries or, or customer sets early on uh, is often very expensive. That, therefore, making the initial decision of which industry to go in to an important one. And I list on the slides a couple of suggested, for anyone who's interested in this, a couple of uh, readings. OK. Um, What's my business model? So as I mentioned before, in the case of, let's say, the, t the case of this uh, broken tooth detection system, one option uh, uh, is to, in this case, the two key options are, are to sell the product, which is what the company's doing. So they're w actually walking up to mines and, and, and selling them um, th these broken teeth uh, de uh, detection systems. The other is to license the technology. So that is to say, look, we've got the software. Uh, we, will sell, we will license it to you and you can manufacture uh, you know, to somebody else who makes other systems for mining ap applications. Um, we'll sell you the, uh, the, the rights to use our IP and you pay us a royalty on every unit sold. Or some permutation of this where Motion Metrics actually manufactures the goods and then, and then gives it to a distributor. Sell the service. Uh, in this case, selling the service was not, is not uh, an option. Another company that uh, I've done some work with where that has, is at the moment pursuing a sell the service idea, this one also happens to be based in Vancouver, is uh, called D-Wave Systems. They're trying to build the, the world's first uh, commercial quantum computer. And there's so much both intellectual property that they want to keep secret, uh, some of which they patented, some of which they haven't, uh, and also the computer itself is so delicate that they've decided rather than s manufacturing these quantum computers and selling them that they're going to have the quantum computer in-house. People will come to them with their problems, with their data, and they will sell the service. Uh, in other words, you give, us the, you give us the data, we'll run it for you, and we'll give you the, the answer. So when one's thinking about these various ways of um, business models, in other words, I, I, I have an idea of my, what my business is, who my customer is, but what's my model, uh, which one of these is my model, two useful parameters to think about in helping you think through uh, which way to, how to develop your business are the issues of complementary assets and the appropriability of, of value. So let me explain what I mean by both of those. In complementary assets, referring to what are the other pieces of the economic process that are required in order to use your piece. So let's say in the case of um, 
motion metrics. They have their broken tooth detection system. The complementary assets could be, one could think of as a distribution channel. So that is to say, uh, how, how important is this distribution channel? If someone else already knows the, the purchasing person at all the major uh, mines worldwide, then there's, this, there's an advantage to, work, to partnering or selling to that distribution company because they have this complementary asset of a distribution channel. Complementary assets might be another technological solution that, is, that one uses concurrently with the one you're selling. Appropriation of, of value, uh, you can think about this as how, how easy is it to protect my innovation. The most common way of appropriating value is, of course, through patent protection. Uh, the other being most common being secrecy. Uh, for startups, patent protection is, is sort of sexy to talk about. It's much harder to implement because even if you can afford the $20,000 or $30,000 to actually file a patent application uh, or a series of patent applications to protect your IP, uh, the two to three to five or whatever million dollars you need to actually enforce it if you go into litigation uh, is usually out of, uh, out of the, uh, what's realistic for, for, a startup, for a startup firm. So there are a couple of, uh, let me just walk through the this, this simple and, and once you hear them, obvious reasons for, uh, we'll call them cooperating versus competing. By cooperating, what I mean here is a strategy of, imagine, just to simplify this, imagine that you are a startup firm and that there's one other firm in that industry and they're the big incumbent or existing firm. So you have two choices as a startup firm. You can either go out into the market on your own, the way Motion Metrics is doing, or you can, and that would be competing, or you can cooperate with the people who are already out there by way of, for example, selling them your product so that they can resell it or you license them the technology so that they can sell it. So, uh, so, so this is cooperating versus competing. And when, you're, and when one is choosing between these strategies, these two things that I mentioned, the excludability environment, which refers to the ability to appropriate or protect your technology, and the complementary asset environment are two of the most important features to, to consider uh, when, when choosing which business model to pursue. Okay, I've just explained what these are. So, going this. so, so what are the benefits from cooperating or, or what is sometimes called engaging the intermediate market? So, for example, if Motion Metrics were to sell its broken tooth system to a distributor, then it is trading in the intermediate market as opposed to, to going to the final customers, uh, which would be the mines. So one thing is savings. That if the incumbent firm has, that's if the big existing firm has already invested in developing the specialized complementary assets, the entrant can save the costs of duplicating this effort and the savings may be shared between the incumbent and the entrant. So you can think of it this way. In the, in the mining case, if Motion Metrics were to partner with an existing firm that already has the distribution channels, then they don't have, Motion Metrics does not have to spend all the money that they're currently sp spending in flying people to every corner of the planet uh, their salespeople to try and establish new sales relations with all these different mines. So they would save all that. And that those savings um, could, in, you know, one could think of those savings as being split between, between the existing firm and, the, and Motion Metrics. And Motion Metrics would save that by saying, look, we're, we won't spend all this money on, on trying to do sales. We'll just give it to you, Mr. Incumbent. You're already in this market and you can uh, sell this product along with all your other products and, and use your existing um, distribution channel, which we won't duplicate. Furthermore, there's less competition. And that means rather than the incumbent firm selling something that uh, solves the broken tooth detection system and the new entrant selling a new system that, that uh, solves the problem, such that there's two competing systems and having competition, of course, drives down the price, which is bad for both of them, uh, that, we'll, that by cooperating, we'll reduce competition, keep our prices higher, and, uh, and then again, we can, we can sort of share in the benefits from that. The primary downside to cooperating is this information. Uh, there's an economist uh, from Berkeley named Ken Arrow who coined this, the, uh, the information paradox, is sometimes called the Arrow paradox, which is this idea that if I have an invention and I come to, to you, 
the, uh, so I'm the seller of the invention, you're the buyer, and I come to the buyer and say, hey, I've got an invention, um, would you like to buy it? And the buyer says, well, uh, well, what is it? And you say, well, this is, this is what it is. Uh, it solves X problem, and therefore it's worth uh, you know, 100 million bucks. And the buyer says, well, I don't know if it's worth 100 million bucks. I, I need to know all the parameters. I need to know how it will work under this condition, that condition. You need to tell me how it works. And I say, well, wait a minute. But if I tell you how it works, then you don't need to buy it from me anymore. You can just go and do it yourself. And the buyer says, yeah, but if you don't tell me how it works, how do I know it's worth 100 million bucks? And so you're, sat, you know, you're sort of stuck. And economists would call this a market failure. That is, that there, there would be a gain from trade. Had the buyer been able to transfer to the seller, they would both benefit. Uh, but a transaction never occurs uh, if, if uh, this market failure due to, for example, Arrow's paradox. Uh, you know, our, a, lot of, a lot of software companies uh, after the mid-'80s refused to take their inventions to Redmond and sell them to Microsoft because they, just, you know, they said, look, this always happens. You go to Microsoft, you tell them, you know, they, they say, well, we've got to know how it works, and then you sort of explain it to them. They say, sorry, we're not interested. And then you know, the, in the next permutation of their product, it turns out your feature is, is there. Um, OK, so these two, these two forces working against one another. Um, and so you know, as a simplified way of thinking about this, that when the complementary assets, when the importance of the complementary assets are low or high, and the excludability, that is uh, how well you can exclude others. So for example, in this case of, the, let's say, the Microsoft case, I'm, I, I've got, I'm a small software developer. I've, got a, a, I've developed a, an algorithm that I think uh, Microsoft will find very valuable. But I'm worried about Microsoft taking it. If I can credibly protect my technology such that Microsoft could not steal it, and if they did, I could, I could um, uh, feasibly come after them, then that would be an environment where excludability is high. In other words, I can effectively exclude someone from using this without my permission. So in terms of those business models that I described earlier, in terms of competing versus cooperating, competing being selling my product in the market, cooperating being licensing and letting someone else sell it, that in an environment where there's a low complementary assets, meaning the competitors don't own some complementary asset that's very valuable to me. And excludability is low, meaning that I can't exclude others. Uh, if they see my invention, they can just go ahead and, and do it, and I can't effectively protect it. Then the obvious um, strategy is to compete. That is to take your technology, found a company, and sell the product. The other uh, diagonal is also an obvious outcome. Uh, where there is high complementary assets and high excludability. Uh, pr probably the most well-known case here is biotech, right? Biotech, there's high complementary assets because pharmaceutical companies have an expertise in taking drugs through the FDA uh, uh, process. They have expertise in manufacturing, in distribution, in branding, all these things that most biotechs don't have. So they've got, uh, the pharma companies have high complementary assets and Patents work reasonably well in biotech. Uh, and so the excluti excludability is high. So it makes sense to cooperate. And in fact, when we look across the economic landscape, what do we see? We see a market structure that reflects this. We see lots of biotech companies that actually never produce end products. In other words, it's an industry set up uh, where there's lots of companies who do drug discovery and then license what they, what they discover uh, downstream to pharmaceutical firms. And, and it seems to be a reasonably stable industry structure. The messy ones are the ones on the, on the off diagonals, where there's, for example, high complementary assets. That means uh, their competitors have important parts of the value chain uh, that are complementary to your product. Uh, and it's hard to protect your product, so it's hard to do a clean uh, transaction. Uh, and, uh, and in this quadrant where there's uh, low complementary assets and high excludability. However, this one is good for the entrepreneur. Basically, you, you know, the entrepreneur can go either way and it does, you know, because the, the competitor doesn't offer much and you could protect it if you wanted to. So in other words, this is sort of an embarrassment of riches and then a whole bunch of sort of secondary issues come into play in terms of thinking through which, which approach is better. 
So it really turns out to be this quadrant, which is the one where there is the most ambiguity over, over what to do. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, it also turns out that you know, much of, of the type of stuff that comes out of universities in particular, which is usually very early stage, uh, ends up falling in this, in this quadrant, uh, where the, it's so early stage that there's lots of important complementary assets that existing firms uh, have control over, and, um, and often low, low excludability. The one exception to this is very often software. Uh, which is why software uh, companies uh, very often can adopt a, a sort of a substantially different um, revenue model or, or uh, business strategy than uh, than startups in other in other types of application or, or, or settings. Okay, um, I only have a few minutes left. I'll just say a, a quick note on this, which is pricing strategy. The, I think the most important point to make here is that many people with a, with who sort of think about who've come to uh, entrepreneurship through an engineering background, they are they approach pricing with a very fair in a very sort of fair minded way, which is to say, uh, is a sort of cost plus mentality. So in other words, it took me this long to make this, and um, you know, this is the amount of my labor, this is the amount of my parts, and so on, and you know, a reasonable profit would be X, and so I sort of figure out all these things, and then I set my price. Um, and as you can see, that's not that different than what was happening in the Google example I, I gave you earlier. Uh, of course, Larry Page would be working for many, many hours to uh, uh, earn the whatever fraction of 100 billion is his at the moment, um, and and the point here is, is that economists and, and, and we do our very best in the business school to try and convert fair-minded engineers into greedy business people, uh, who rather than thinking about pricing things in a cost-plus way, think about pricing things in terms of uh, value, which is how much value can you. Uh, you know what is what is the value to the buyer of the of the product that you're creating totally uh, um, de- independent of the cost and there let me just let me just sort of finish this point by saying there are courses in the business school that are dedicated to the single topic of pricing. So in other words, you, you, know, you can go for two courses, pricing one and pricing two, that was 26 weeks of, of, of lectures on pricing. Um, and that sounds, you must think to yourself, God, those business school people, they can take a simple thing and really um, you know, squeeze it for, for all it's worth. It turns out to be really, really important that there's a, a very sophisticated amount of a calculus that goes behind, it essentially becomes a, a series of optimization problems of optimizing, uh, optimizing revenues conditional on, you know, by the lever that you have at your disposal to maximize revenue is price. And where the, where the interesting parts come in is, to, is, is in understanding demand curves. That is, there is v- variation across different customers' willingness to pay. So different cust- if, if think about if different customers value a good at a different value, then to, to the extent one is able to charge different people different prices, and there's lots of different ways of, of, of doing that, uh, that you know, pricing can, can quite quickly become a very, uh, a very um, a sophisticated topic. And I think one of the most interesting things to, to look at for those who just sort of have a passing interest is thinking about how Google auctions off words uh, online. Right? So in other words, when you go to buy an ad, which of course, you know, for those of you who opened the paper this morning and said, oh cool, you know, Google now has a flu virus application uh, for helping you, you know, find wh- which, when your city has got sort of high, high um, uh, flu likelihoods. Um, and you think to yourself, isn't that a great public resource? How come Google's doing this and not, uh, and, and not NIH? Er, you know, everything Google does is financed by advertising. 
And their advertising model is so successful because of the, of the way it's priced. It's incredibly flexible pricing due to the auction, auctioning process of auctioning off every single word has is, is, is got its own auction price. Um, anyhow, so, so that's a quick note on, on that. Uh, so my last slide is there's a variety of people for those who are interested around the business school that uh, work with people that are doing technology-based startups. Uh, every year I run a course where MBA students do uh, business plans. Um, if you're interested, you're welcome to send me a one-page summary of what you're doing. If you would like uh, the, to be considered for having some MBAs um, uh, work on uh, helping you develop a business plan for what you're doing, uh, we, I take usually end up working with four uh, a year. Um, so by December 15, uh, if, you, if you would like to submit something, feel free, um, which also involves, uh, I offer a 30-minute feedback session myself. Um, and, and my email. So we have a few minutes for questions, if there are any. Okay.